Hello, my name is Gloria J. Brown Marshall. I am chair of the International Subcommittee of Members of ASALA, the Association for the Study of African American Life in History. And this is a Black History Month event brought to us by our international members. And we're discussing international issues. And this day, we're so excited because Dr. Woodson was an international person. He was a scholar, but he traveled the world and he traveled to the Philippines. Today, we're going to have a program following in Dr. Woodson's global footprints. 
we have with us a member of our international subcommittee, Dr. Mary Ann Alabanza Akers. Dr. Akers is Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at Morgan State University. Dr. Akers is a Filipino immigrant who was interested in the African American presence in the Philippines. With that being said, I give you Dr. Akers. Thank you very much for that introduction. Hello and welcome to everyone. I would like to share with you some of my findings and my research about Dr. Woodson and his experience and other African-American experiences in the Philippines. The title of my presentation is Miseducation of the Negro Filipino, Parallel Frames of Unwellness. Welcome again, I'd like to introduce you to Bata. Bata in my uh, language is a child. And as you can see, our Filipinos um, have very similar features as African-Americans. So uh, I'd like to introduce you to Bata. These are Filipinos as well. They come from various parts of the Philippines. And I'll tell you more about the Philippines and the history. Um, I am more familiar with the Negritos, who we refer to as a uh, tribal group that live in the mountains. And uh, they were the ones, actually, who had cultural their culture was culture was intact in the sense that they were not colonized by the Spaniards and the Americans. I would like to introduce you also again to Bata and um, Kuya, which means older brother. The land bridge theory of Philippine history is starts from the notion that Asia, Africa, was one land continent. But due to uh, the ice age and the melting of the glaciers, um, the different islands were then uh, separated from the larger land mass. So here is just a map. Again, I, I talked about the big land mass here. Here's Africa. There has been evidence to show that Africans actually migrated down to Asia over here, and then down to Asia all the way to even Australia. The Philippines is this group of islands called our, our, an archipelago of these islands. But as I mentioned, we were one land mass. And so with that said, there are remnants of uh, the, ne the Negritos or African-American tribes in the Philippines. Here's just a map of the archipelago. We have 1,701 islands. As you can see, it's um, many of our leaders find it very difficult to uh, govern all these different islands because there are many, many subgroups within these islands. We have 175 dialects, different dialects. So I remember growing up in the Philippines, just a few kilometers from me would, would be people who speak another dialect. We have scattered throughout the archipelago, 25 ethno-linguistic Negrito groups. So they are not just in this large island, but they're all over the country. So here is a timeline of Philippine history, just to show you that this history, our ancestral history has taken place thousands and thousands of years ago. However, they were not documented. What was documented was when the Spaniards came in 1521, 
all the way to when the Americans came in 1898 and stayed up to 1946. But this colonial period is the most documented of Philippine history. Here, when the Americans came, and just to give you a context, the Americans came uh, in 1898 because they, due to a treaty called the Treaty of Paris, where Spain gave up uh, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines as part of that treaty. And so the Americans, to a, certain, to a large extent, didn't know anything about the Philippines because we were half around the world, but they inherited, in quotes, the Philippines. And they were so uh, gung-ho about um, civilizing us. So here is a very good depiction of how Uncle Sam came to the Philippines and decided he needed to scrub our brown skin so that we can look more like the Americans. Um, the Americans had a very good strategy on how to imperialize and how to make us more Americans. In fact, we were called brown Americans. So here's Uncle Sam through education. And this is where Dr. Woodson comes into the picture. Uncle Sam thought that by giving the American educational system to the Philippines, that we will be more like them. And so um, the, the famous phrase, benevolent assimilation, has been passed around Congress and among other uh, leadership, American leadership in Washington, DC. And they sent um, several groups of Americans to establish a demographic, uh, demo, sorry, a democratic government as well as education. They infused also infrastructure as part of developing the country to be more like America. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting in this picture where you see the natives looking at Uncle Sam with these two Thomasites or teachers, and I'll talk more about them, you know, kind of confused. They didn't know what this was about. So it started, the educational system started when they sent in 1898, they sent American teachers to the Philippines. Many of them were Caucasian females, but I also found out in my research that there was one African-American man who came in 1901, but they took the USS Thomas and that's why they're called Thomasite. Here is America again coming to the Philippines and uh, making sure that we are civilized in our manners, in our way of thinking, in our dress, in our food and everything else. We were made subservient and in fact were displayed in various world fairs. Um, here are two uh, images of what they wanted to depict the Filipinos um, when these world fairs took place here in the United States. So the picture down here, this image down here, are some of our indigenous tribes that were not colonized by either Spain, particularly by Spain, because the Spaniards were in the Philippines more than 300 years. So here's another depiction of uh, America saying, we know what's best for you, therefore you come and tell us, not tell us, but you just follow what we tell you. So in um, 1898, there was a Philippine war where prior to the coming of the Americans, there was a group of Filipinos revolutionaries who tried to 
um, kick out Spain, but of course, Spain had 300 years plus of being in the Philippines. But this group of revolutionaries thought that when Spain gave us to the United States that we found an ally in the United States. But little did the revolutionaries know that Americans were also fighting them. So the Philippine War um, took place in 1898. And as part of the military, they also, the, the United States, had several contingents of African-American soldiers. And in, in, in my research, I found out that many of our African-American soldiers that came to the Philippines, in fact, had, had the conflict of conscience because they also saw how they were treated in, by their uh, military uh, peers, but how, how the military also treated the Filipinos as inferior. Um, so many of them, in fact, some of them stayed and uh, helped train the revolutionary movement on how to win the war against America. But we did not have the supplies. We did not have uh, all the, all the uh, support to actually win the war. So here is, um, again, other, other images that showed how the United States wanted to inculcate American values and change the way that we look at the world. So I, I, I just um, want to show you here, even music um, is a very good depiction of an American soldier, um, sharing a uh, gamophone with uh, the one of the indigenous tribe. Here we have some African-American soldiers who actually taught Filipinos how to play baseball. Here, down here are Filipinos in the market, but even in our cuisine, we were trained and taught that American cuisine is, um, superior than Filipino cuisine. So in other words, many of these that are being sold, that were being sold in the market were considered inferior ingredients. Um, one strategy that the United States employed was sending the elites here to the United States, let them um, feel what it was like to live in the United States educate them and take them back to the Philippines so they can start their various schools. And that's actually what happened. Here's another cultural imposition of the United States. See this bear brand milk? I remember as a kid, this was the brand to uh, use and to drink. Anything that was American was considered superior and anything that was local, like Carabao milk, was considered inferior and not healthy. And then the ivory soap here with the baby, a white baby. Um, again, even our soaps and cosmetics, if it's an American brand, it was always viewed as superior. Um, and I'll talk more about even the way, since I'm in the architecture school, the way our um, uh, houses were designed. Uh, I talked about Senator Coffee. Um, I, I don't know what that is. Maybe the generation before me knew what that is. Um, and then, of course, the teeth, uh, you know, whitening the teeth and all that, anything cosmetic was uh, brought to the Philippines and uh, we were taught that they were much better. So here is again, um, designs of government offices, government buildings. Again, I mentioned that the United States government came and uh, imposed the democratic type of government. So even the buildings were very, um, imperial in, in design. So Dr. Woodson was part, he came in 1902, 
three, and I'll, I'll show you more um, the next slide. But I just want to also share with you how I grew up, even with this American imposition. My parents always felt that um, we as a family should celebrate our authentic uh, heritage. And so even as a young girl, uh, our lawn was filled with indigenous symbols like this nipa hat. My dad is also an architect and he designed it. We were laughed at by my neighbors uh, because they were saying, wait, 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 that doesn't look American. That looks very Filipino. So we were laughed at, but we said, no, but this is who we are. So why not? And then behind here is a picture of and I didn't realize this until I came to the United States and looked at my uh, childhood pictures. But behind is another painting that shows indigenous huts. So my parents early on uh, trained us, although they were educated here in the United States, they trained us that we should not marginalize our original uh, heritage. Here's Dr. Wids Woodson, um, and I'll just read some of the passages about him. African-American teachers used their positions within empire, the American empire, to disrupt the linking of civilization and modernity with whiteness. Black teachers argue that their racial sympathy with the Filipino people made them most fit to be benevolent colonizers. I have read stories where uh, Black teachers made friends faster and more authentically than the, the other teachers, although there were also quite a few of um, white female teachers who were very committed to the cause. So for African-American teachers, Participation in empire presented opportunities that were unavailable to them in the United States. So they positioned themselves as representatives of America. So here is Dr. Woodson, who was in the Philippines from December 1903 to early February 1907, three years. And I'm still trying to look for um, evidence, but there was one piece of publication where it was hinted that he had health problems because it was tropical. Um, it was a tropical weather. And so he was not very, his, his, his uh, physical body was not attuned to uh, tropical weather as in other Americans. So here I found this Dr. Woodson's poster where if you look at this in the upper right, that is a depiction of his time in the Philippines. So he was a supervisor of schools. And in fact, he was a supervisor for um, one of the provinces, about two provinces down the mountain from us. So um, that's him and his, uh, again, his notion and his footsteps in the Philippines depicted in a tropical scenery. So Dr. Wids Woodson said, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him back to the back door. 50 years after Dr. Woodson wrote the book Miseducation of the Negro, Dr. Renato Constantino, a Filipino scholar, also wrote a manuscript based on the Miseducation of the Negro and um, titled it The Miseducation of the Filipino. And here is what he says. The most effective means of subjugating a people is to capture their minds, very much like what Dr. Woodson said. Military victory does not necessarily signify conquest. As long as feelings of resistance remain in the hearts of the vanquished, no conqueror is secure. Education, therefore, serves as a weapon in wars of colonial conquest. So 
as I mentioned, the African American teachers and soldiers were very ambivalent about the role that um, they actually took on with the Philippines. Um, I remember reading a few uh, stories about how Africans, African Americans were like the soldiers, for example, and the teachers uh, really took us as took us in as their brothers and sisters. They called us their brown brothers and sisters and treated us like family. And in turn, in return, the Philippines, Filipinos also welcomed them in their homes and in their families. I've even read where many of the African-American soldiers and teachers became godfathers and godmothers of many of the Filipino kids. Um, here is um, also what Dr. Woodson said about Negro colleges. They offer courses in Greek philosophy and in that of modern European thought, but they direct no attention to the philosophy of the American. Very much like the educational system that I went through. I remember in high school, as well as in college, oftentimes, we were taught, and in elementary, we were taught American history over Filipino history. So it was American history taught first, and then Filipino history as a sidebar. And again, that's part of the miseducation of the Filipino. Here is a, a, an image of a Thomasite um, educating the Filipino students. Here's another book that to me uh, says a lot about our colonial minds, brown skin, white minds. We are still, I personally am still grappling with that because again, once you're conditioned to believe that anything American is, white American is superior, you know, that's, that's a little difficult to take off, but I am peeling off the layers of, uh, this miseducation. America's Empire in the Philippines, another great book that talks about how the Americans subjugated us. Um, I talked about the elites, the Filipino elites. That's how both the Spaniards and the Americans try to um, inculcate their own values. Uh, because they thought that by taking care of the elites and changing their values that the rest, the masses would follow. Here is a sample of a family where the man was actually sent here. Many of our elites were in fact sent to Ivy League schools and to show them that, hey, you know, um, if you're educated here, uh, go back and tell them what you've learned. So. Here, is, here are two other quotes that I would like to share with you. One of the most striking evidences of the failure of higher education among Negroes is their estrangement from the masses. Constantino says the first and perhaps the master stroke in the plan to use education as an instrument of colonial policy was the decision to use English as the medium of instruction. English became the wedge that separated the Filipinos from their past and later to separate educated Filipinos from the masses. Again, separation of the elites from the masses was one way of making sure that um, the masses would look up at uh, the elites. I remember when uh, I come from a mountain city that was imperialized by the Americans and we were taught English. English in my family is our first language and Tagalog because my mom is from uh, Pasay City, which is in Manila. Um, Tagalog was not spoken readily in our, in our family. So English was. And when I went to college down in Manila, they weren't speaking English as a regular language. And I remember that uh, it was difficult for um, a few of my uh, college friends 
uh, or people I met, they would always see me as, oh, she's so elite, she speaks English. So that rift between elites and the masses is really a reality. But at the same time, the way that the Americans, um, again, changed our minds and brainwashed us, was the elites were also the ones that uh, were in the movies. They were the ones that were um, in leadership, um, national leadership. So the masses looked up at them as well. Um, so that's to show that both Dr. Woodson and Dr. Constantino did have parallel frames of unwellness, I would call it unwellness. So thank you very much. And um, we welcome questions. Thank you. That was a highly illuminating um, presentation. I am so fascinated by all that we have as connected history, as well as the individual standalone history of the Philippines and would like to know more about it. If there are particular books you can think of, let me know and you know our audience will definitely be interested in learning more about that shared history and about the history of the Philippines. Um, we have some questions and one question is, you mentioned the elite. And so divide and conquer has been a very successful strategy for a millennia. And the Europeans seem to use divide and conquer quite often and so do um, um, white Americans. So um, divide and conquer, we, you talked about how it worked there as far as having the elite um, speaking English and having an education and separating them from the masses. How about the um, Filipino Americans? Is there still this close relationship between Filipinos in America, or is there this class-based or, or, or sense of separation and divide and conquer in when the United States, now that we've gone into several generations of Philippines, Filipinos yes. in America? Yes. So yes, um, divide and conquer was a very good strategy. Our waves of Filipino immigration here started way back, even in the early 1900s, where um, the, Na the Navy actually had uh, Filipino men who served in the Navy. So that was one wave. Another wave was uh, the Filipino nurses and doctors, because there, was, there were not enough Filipino nurse, I mean, there were not enough nurses and health professionals in Appalachia, in rural America. So they had this um, attraction uh, strategy of Filipinos um, who had the skills to come here. So in a way, they they came here like in the, in the um, mid 1900s. But guess what? Again, because they were taught we were taught to assimilate. It's important that you assimilate. So that generation tried to make no waves. They just tried to follow, follow the rules and follow uh, what white America was telling them. Go to work, find a house, let your kids be educated like white Americans. Don't talk too much about Philippine history or Filipino culture and you'll be fine. So that's assimilation. And so, um, and even to this day, is there still um, friction or is there a commonality between Filipino Americans and African Americans? You teach at Morgan State and that's an HBCU. So in your situation, I see that is maintaining that connectedness. Is that yeah. something we can generally see between the African American and Filipino American communities? Yes, actually, the younger generation are very, are allies of Black Americans. So uh, when you see Black Lives Matter, you may see uh, some Filipinos in that movement as well, younger Filipinos. As I said, many of the immigrants, when they came here, they tried not to make waves. But I am very hopeful 
that the new generation do have very good uh, relationships with African Americans. And I, I notice, and this is a side, that there are sometimes, a, um, a, you know, visibly um, Filipino um, um, nurses, doctors, people who are working in the healthcare, you know, uh, community. Is that mm -hmm. left over from that earlier time? Yes. But there was also a wave about 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, where another wave of health professionals came. And just about 20, 25 years ago, there was a wave of educators as well, because many of, um, there was a lack, not a lack, but uh, the, especially the inner, in urban schools, it was difficult for them to, uh, place teachers. And so they did get from the Philippines and place them in urban schools. So and there's that connection again. Yes. And I guess because there was already that bridge out of all the countries in the world, they were, they were saying, yeah. well, we have this bridge with the Philippines. So let's reach out to fill the need here. Um, yep. Okay. Um, Negritos, you mm -hmm. showed us a picture of Baba and others. And so I'm trying to understand um, if they were not colonized, how are they doing? Because when I see Filipinos, I don't see dark skinned Filipinos in the United States. And to see those dark skinned Filipinos reminds me of when I've been in Cuba and other places where most of the dark skinned people are still in those homelands. And it's the light skinned um, members who come to the United States or have the opportunities. Is that what's happened with the Negritos? Very much so. It's it again, it's a parallel reality. The Negritos are marginalized in um, Philippine society. So when I did a little research on them, uh, they, they're, they're very poor. They're still in agriculture, which is uh, you know good, but at the same time, they were not given the resources to develop as a community. And remember, there are like in, in one particular community, there, there was only 150 Negrito members in that community. And, and when they start intermarrying or intermarrying um, with uh, Filipinos, although they, they are Filipinos, uh, then their culture dissipates and um, that's just the reality, but there is a movement now to look again at these Negrito tribes and what the government can do to uplift them. So there's been a, a very similar type of oppression based on their dark skin against yes. the Negritos there. Did they have actual um, law-based segregation of the Negritos? No, there was no, um, as far as I know, there was no law about that. Um, they kept to themselves. And I think that's also one of the uh, reasons why they were not colonized. They were way, way up in the mountains in really remote areas. Um, and so with that said, um, of course, the national government wanted them to assimilate into regular uh, Filipino uh, culture. Uh, but as I said, not much resources has been given to them. But I think that's changing now. Um, but I'll have to do a little more research for next year's presentation. Okay. And one last question I see um, in the chat, and that is, um, this is a theme of Black health and wellness. And you talked about cultural identity and having that cultural identity um, being taken away by many people um, for, for generations as a, as a strategy of oppression. And so in, in looking at cultural identity and, and the work of Dr. Woodson, as well as Dr. Cadestino, what do you think we should learn about cultural identity and health and wellness? Mm -hmm. So again, with that's why these are parallel frames of unwellness, because when your mind 
um, is conditioned to think that you're inferior, that affects your worldview, that affects your wellness. And so that's why it's unwe you're unwell if you think that you should not celebrate your own culture or you downplay your culture. Um, that does not, and of course, if you feel inferior, uh, um, that also impacts your physical health. So that's where that intersection uh, uh, lies is in terms of health and wellness is inferiority complex. And that's still so real among Filipinos. And this is a question I've asked many people on these Black history panels we've had. And of course, we're here with Dr. Akers discussing um, the miseducation of the Filipino and those um, commonalities between the miseducation of the Negro. Why do you think it's important to commemorate or celebrate to lift up Black History Month and Black history generally? Mm -hmm. Well, um, if we go back to our uh, ancestral heritage, we all come, come from Africa. And so why not celebrate that? Because the blood that runs through our veins are African, is African blood. So we are black many, many centuries. We may not look, but our blood run, the black blood runs through our veins. So, and, and that's for another, another talk about uh, allyship and all that. To me, it's more than allyship. It's deeper, deeper than just allyship, but we are in the same boat, but in a way also different, but the same. We're, we're, all, we're oppressed. We're, you know, we're, and so why not stand with each other? Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. And this has been such an eye-opening and mind-blowing experience to learn so much about the, the commonalities between these experiences and to learn about um, uh, Filipino history and, and how Dr. Woodson played a role in Filipino history and how what he laid down in his footprints back then is still traveling with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Akers. Thank you.